All right, today we have a couple of guests. The first is Philip Moritz, co-founder and CTO, and Goku Mohandas, ML and product uh, lead at uh, AnyScale. And full disclosure, of course, I'm an advisor to AnyScale, as many of you know. And uh, for our listeners who are not familiar with AnyScale, they are the startup uh, created by the creators of the dis popular distributed computing platform, Ray. So, Philip and Goku, welcome to the Data Exchange Podcast. Yeah, thanks for having us, Ben. Thanks for having us. Nice to meet you all. All right. So, for today, uh, the focus... I think because of the popularity of LLMs, one of the most popular uh, ways people use LLMs, I guess it's kind of like the hello world example, although we're going to go beyond hello world in this conversation, are uh, retrieval augmented generation systems, so RAG in, in, uh, for short. So let me quickly... Uh, point out that uh, Philip and Goku have written uh, a blog post, which I think will become like the default reference for RAG for many of us. And in their blog post, which I will link to in the episode notes, they give a high level description of a basic RAG architecture, which uh, let me just briefly cover it. So you have a query, you take that query, you pass it through an embedding model to represent that query. And that embedding, embedding gets past a vector database, and you have some information retrieval algorithm that retrieves uh, relevant content, which that's then gets passed to a large language model, which generates the response. So, in their blog post, they point out that yes, this is the basic rag, but when you drill down, there's so many options along the way. Uh, so, for example, what embedding should I use? How do I chunk the data? What information retrieval algorithm should I use? And so on and so forth. So, first of all, um, did you folks know that uh, <laughs> that uh, there was there were a lot of options to use? Because uh, I have to admit to our listeners, when I start started first using RAG, I just used it blindly, right? So basically, here's a bunch of PDFs. I just follow some kind of example, and then I start getting some responses, which look reasonable. But then it was only at some point when I realized that I knew actually what were what was in the PDFs well, mm -hmm. that I realized that, hey, this thing seems to be missing some things. Mm -hmm. And then I started realizing there were a lot of things to tweak. So were you guys aware of this from the get-go, or was did you also realize it after the fact? I think a, a little bit, right? Um, there's a lot of great libraries and in general, a lot of people talking about these things. Everybody's trying to build these contextual applications for their own data sources and use cases. But I think when we got lower and lower, we just realized just how many knobs there are. Um, and, you know, there, like I said earlier, there are a lot of different libraries you can use. We opted to kind of build from scratch a little bit just so we can actually control all these different knobs. I think theoretically you could do it at any abstraction level, but it made it very easy for us to do that. Um, and some of these knobs are really crucial. Some of them you could spend days iterating and it may not yield a lot for you. So we realized just how vast the space uh, search space is for us. And then what we didn't have in the beginning was how can we evaluate all these different choices? Uh, and and some of them, uh, they're all correlated, right? It's not you cannot view them in isolation. So, uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of things to control and and to, and tune, and we needed a way to evaluate. So that was kind of the daunting thing in front of us first uh, when we installed this. And, and yeah. Philip, uh, Philip, uh, these experiments actually are very computationally intensive, right? It, depending on the number of documents you have, which obviously. Uh, you want to be able to use a lot of documents, if possible, in your RAG application. Yep, that's right. And that's where Ray um, has really helped um, in parallelizing this um, and being able to run experiments and parallelizing over, like, for example, embedding calculations, doing that on multiple GPUs um, and doing the experiments very quickly. <clears throat> so, Goku, you mentioned something about evaluation. So, let's drill down. So, exactly what you mean uh in that aspect and uh, what are the things that you learned as you were going through your rag journey mm. uh so i think as a community and industry and certainly between philip and i uh 
we're all familiar with evaluating supervised applications, right? You have a label data set with inputs and outputs. And depending on the modality and what you're trying to do, you have a set of metrics that you usually take out of the box and, and, and calculate. You may have some custom ones on top. But for a generative case like this, it's, uh, first of all, it's non-trivial for how you need to evaluate. And there are some metrics out there, um, you know, that have to relate with entropy and things like that. But for our specific use case, you know, we're building a RAG system on top of our context, which in this was uh, our Ray documentation. Um, those metrics don't really mean much to us. Uh, you can still use those, but they don't really signify whether this specific configuration is better than another one. So we we kind of said, okay, if we, we know we want to evaluate this. We know we want to quantifiably evaluate this, not just do a vibe check, you know, like passing five inputs and looking at the outputs that just won't be granular enough. And then within the quantitatively evaluating this, we need to break it down, right? In our RAG system, the first level of separation could be there's the retrieval aspect, which you pointed out, and then there's the generative aspect. Can we try to break down evaluation at that level first, at least, and then try to get metrics there first? And then we can look at the overall performance. So, uh, Philip, you have a PhD in machine learning from Michael Jordan. So, how does evaluation so this is a very different sort of machine learning from kind of the classical machine learning evaluation metrics that we're used to, right? So, so is this uh, how much how much of academic studies this, or or was there any literature to fall back on? In other words, so I would say some of the things um, that we know from uh, um, the literature and machine learning were definitely useful. I mean, concepts like test data sets and like um, and certain evaluation metrics um, were useful. But then a lot of the more classical NLP metrics like loose cause and so on, are actually I would say not, not as useful in this domain because oftentimes the questions are more open-ended and longer. And so, um, um, yeah, uh, and some of this classical stuff is like not super useful. <clears throat> yeah. So Goku, uh, one of the things about LLMs that uh, I think, uh, is different from other uh, kind of uh, uh, AI and ML kind of trends was the accessibility, right? So I frequently describe this as a, we've entered the product hunt phase of AI, meaning uh, now, now the people who are building AI apps are the same people who used to just basically hang out at product hunt, right? So a anyone can, can build an AI app. You don't need a PhD in ML. But now when you guys start talking about evaluation metrics, doesn't that raise the need again for some level of expertise or no? A hundred percent. I'll let Philip share his thoughts too. But um, first of all, I think it's great that more and more people from different backgrounds are able to first develop with machine learning and AI and actually um, create products out of it. So overall, I think that's a great thing. But um, when we actually move past the tinkering or, or development phase and actually need to put create products out of this, you need to evaluate, right? So now you have a, a smaller subset of those folks and products making it through. And yeah, even with a generative case like this, because there's so many things to control in your data source, and nothing is static, right? Your data continues to change. Your models themselves will continue to change. Um, you have to think about this and you need to have at least a, a decent understanding of how evaluation works, how you want to evaluate uh, and continuously like make sure that the changes that you're making are actually improving your system. So we'll get into the details in this talk, I'm sure, but um, you do you do need to be aware of all of that. And you, you have to understand at least a little bit about how the machine learning world works uh, when you're creating applications like this. The, the difference I would say um, with um, uh, previously is that now you oftentimes don't have to tune as many knobs and things are not as brittle and the LMs are very powerful um, already out of the box. So like um, they sort of want you to succeed. And like, um, whereas previously, like oftentimes you need to tinker things um, until it really starts working. And so that's really, I think, where it gets a lot more broadly applicable. And like now you can hit a REST API, right? And, and get the results without needing to know about the underlying GPUs and all the technology. So that makes it a lot more um, broad, broadly applicable. But if you have the machine learning knowledge, then you can do a lot more and um, develop a lot more effective applications. Correct, yeah. A little bit of a double-edged sword because I think we've all spent a lot of time 
uh, tuning supervised, let's say supervised deep learning models, sometimes you may just spend so much time trying to get the learning rate right and it's for convergence to happen. In this scenario, um, it'll always appear like it's working, right? You're going to get maybe even great outputs, but uh, without evaluation, it's hard to know, like, am I moving towards the right direction? Uh, whereas with supervised deep learning, we I'm sure we've spent a lot of time tweaking things, trying to get it to at least even work first pass, right? Um, so before we leave the topic of evaluation, so would you say that what you learned as far as your your own evaluation metrics for, uh, in, in your case, uh, aimed at a RAG application targeting RAID documentation, mm -hmm. would you say those learnings are general enough that will map to any kind of uh, RAG application? Most of them, I would say, yes. Um, and there's actually some very interesting learnings, including um, some of the parameters are actually sort of a little bit counterintuitive. Like, for example, the embeddings actually turns out um, like just taking the best embedding model in the leaderboard is not necessarily the best um, choice here. And the defaults of some popular libraries are also not the best choice necessarily. Um, and then also the chunking, for example, like it, you can actually do, if you do this in a, in a good way, um, taking into consideration, for example, the structure of your documents, that can really improve the performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in the blog post, we talk about this in a lot more detail, but we broke down evaluation um, to retrieval score and then the generative score. And for retrieval, it's you have a, a, a query and a golden source. So with the configuration that you have, when you pass the query, let's say out of your top K retrieve sources, is that golden source in there? That, so this is almost like a, a recall of sorts, right? A hit rate. And then the other side is given the absolute best source, how well can we generate the response given this? So that's like the breakdown. Uh, between the evaluation. And I think this extends really well to any RAG application on any data source. Um, you may you may tweak, you know, how many top K is and whether you want to ensure that it's in the, uh, you know, one or two golden sources, whatever it is. But the I think at a high level, the way we thought about evaluation um, can successfully extend to um, m the vast majority of people building RAG applications. So I'm a developer tasked with building a RAG application. I don't have a lot of time. Mm -hmm. I can only optimize either chunking or embedding. Mm -hmm. Which one would you recommend as a heuristic? Which one would do you think would get uh, me further? I would go for the chunking and then take um, take some embedding model that like makes sense mm -hmm. given what like other people have found. Um, I think that's probably good. Yeah, I internally we're starting to come up with our like ranked list heuristics. Of yeah. Yeah, right. Of which we think are like the biggest levers that we we should spend time on. Um, so now that we have our evaluation workflow in place, we can make these choices very quickly. And you know, with Ray, we can do all these data intensive operations quickly and get that number uh, for each configuration. But yeah, I would I would agree. I think chunking is the big one. And actually, even when we released the blog post, so many people uh, on social media came back with comments saying, "Hey, I'm spending a lot of time on chunking, trying to create a generalized way to chunk things." Because the the default right now is you have a you have a corpus just randomly split based on length, right? And you may end up cutting off things that shouldn't be cut off and uh, having too small chunks. So chunking we feel is is a contextual thing, but it's one of the most important things. Yeah, work. yeah. And chunking, like you said, uh, Goku. So usually uh, the library will say, okay, uh, you can specify the length, but I'll make sure I don't cut it off at the end of a before the end of a sentence or something like that, right? Yeah. So so with the embeddings, I guess the other challenge, Philip, is uh, even if you wanted to uh, optimize the embeddings, they're inherently more computationally intensive, right? Because uh, you've got to re-embed the entire vector database, or am I wrong? Yep, that's right. Um, and typically, you need to use uh, TPUs to be really effective here, and yeah. Um, that's right. So, so, so are, is the claim that there's no point at all trying to play around with embeddings or or the, the benefits is, is so minimal that it's not worth it? No, I would say it's just not the first thing you, you optimize. Right. But like, um, um, first of all, by selecting the right base model, the right base model, you can get a decent amount of improvements. Um, so it's definitely worth looking into it at least. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can also find the embeddings. <clears throat> yep. Yeah, we're, we're learning that um, definitely depends on your use case. But let's say your your context is in the world of legal or, or biology. 
where these open source models, just the way they represent their text with sub tokens and the way they were pre-trained, um, you know, with mass tokens, next token prediction, the vocabulary that they're used to could be drastically different from yours. So here it would make a lot of sense. I, again, I would still say chunking might be the best thing to uh, kind of work on, but now here actually fine tuning your embedding layer might be very impactful because the way you, certain tokens and sub tokens are represented could be very different for your use case and you should actually fine tune it on, on that. Um, so this is one of the things we're actively working on and uh, I'm excited to share the quality updates on that as well. I'd love for you guys, you know, this is not a high priority, but I'd love for you guys to do one one pass at the information extraction piece for people with PDFs or Word files, which is uh, what library, because Python, there's so many PDF extraction libraries, right? So which one of these uh, is really getting the most out of my PDFs, right? I don't know, because I, I don't have time to try more than one thing. Yeah, right. Yep. And it's also fairly com computationally expensive. So that's something where Array, again, can be a great solution. <clears throat> yeah, 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 yeah. And so mm -hmm. how about information retrieval? Um, you know, I mean, uh, the vector database vendors, they make a big deal about, yeah, we can do hybrid search, which for them means BM25 plus some mm -hmm. nearest neighbor algorithm, right? So mm -hmm. did you guys play around with various retrieval algorithms? Not much yet, but what we are definitely um, playing around with and um, what um, can help a lot is um, ha having some sort of ranking um, on, on the top results. Um, and because at the end of the day, you are only going to be able to fit um, a limited number of things into the LM due to context window. And so um, being able to select the things um, that you feed in. And there it's also um, your domain expertise in your um, for your application can make a big difference. Like if you know the user is searching for a certain kind of thing, then ranking those results higher um, can really help and things like that. <clears throat> Correct, yeah. I think a lot of the re-ranking logic um, that we know today, they're like very general, right? In fact, they're models that are retrained periodically, which is great. So if your application is a general one and it can be well mapped with these global re-rankers, that makes sense. But if you're building for your own specific context, um, we're doing this right now, it may make a lot of sense to spend some time on IR and trying to come up with a re-ranking solution that's contextual to you to you once you get the top K, which subset of that now deserves the most attention. Uh, and by the way, these are all really important because you cannot just feed in everything that you get, right? There, all of these models have limitations on uh, their context length and and that depends, that's also heavily tied to your chunking logic again, right? So they're all very dependent on each other and we want to be able to pass in the most useful information um, to our LMs and, and we need a way to actually decide what is the most useful. And even if you could feed in everything, mm -hmm. it would still, it's bad if you feed the wrong information, Correct. then the LM will like, um, might use that and, and produce the wrong answer. So it, um, it's, uh, yeah, um, making sure that you feed the right information is a really crucial step. Um, <clears throat> So, so uh, this might be kind of an unfair question because you guys were uh, building this uh, application on your documentation, which probably doesn't change as often as, say, a like the New York Times website or Reddit or whatever. So what's your intuition in terms of frequency of updating the embeddings or, and whatnot? Yeah, I, I, first of all, I that's a great point. Um, even with our documentation, right, we found tremendous impact for having the ability to scale the different workloads, but starting from ingestion to chunking, embedding, indexing, um, and then putting it all together for evaluation. For something that is so dynamic, like New York Times or even something, let's say even something like in TikTok, right, things are changing all the time. I think the ability to do these things at scale and the ability to actually represent this live data coming in into this global corpus that you have to be able to interact with is so important. Um, we're Even for our documentation, as static as it is, we're actually uh, thinking a lot about setting up pipelines so that anytime there's an update, right, it's a, we're actually able to incorporate that um, and have it ready to go to use as a knowledge base. Um, one more note, I'll add, you know, we I know a lot of folks, we talk to a lot of people that are building these applications where the moment they leave from a meeting, they want to have those meeting notes available uh, through their application. And to have to have all these compute intensive workloads occurring for something that just happened, you need to kind of build these things at, at scale from the get-go. Um, 
Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of lag and you're going to miss out on that. So there's two, uh, there's two dimensions to this, right? So there's the, uh, okay, so I've got this body of documents and I've got new documents coming in, or I have this body of documents, a few of them get updated. Mm -hmm. So there's incremental updates and maybe completely new inserts, but in either case, don't I have to re-index? I mean, if I'm going to do search, right? The index will change if I make any changes, if I have new documents. or So at the very minimum, you want to be able to do the embeddings fast. Mm -hmm. right? So scale, so array and stuff. So, But then what limits your ability to re-index? Or, or what if, Goku, you have metadata filters, right? So I only want documents that pertain to, you know, the state of California, mm -hmm. so whatever, whatever, like, so then you start, oh, right now you guys are using Postgres. So Postgres mm -hmm. will have to support met metadata filters, right. incremental updates. So uh, most of this is on whatever data management system you're uh, using, right? So the burden of most of the things I mentioned, is that right? Yep, yep. Postgres is actually very flexible in these regards, and um, you can easily do things like versioning um, for each document individually, and and like you can have arbitrary. You have the full power of SQL, right? So you can have arbitrary metadata right. and other tables. It also has the advantage that um, many people already have existing applications where they use Postgres, and then and then you can reuse those. Um, but yeah, Ben, that's a really good point. Anytime you tweak something that is going to impact the way your chunks and docs are being represented, um, you will have to account for that and, and rebuild these, right? Otherwise you have a, a mixture of different- but, but not everything, right? So you have to incrementally update the things that change, maybe insert the new embeddings, exactly. but then don't you have to rebuild the index? You can do it in an incremental way. Um, okay. yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, that allows you to have a sense of a little more real time I think a lot of these things will have to be somewhat real time, right? Yes, right. Uh, you don't want to every time you know every time all this knowledge is accumulated. You don't want to have a lag of two weeks until the index is rebuilt next time for you to be able to interact with the information that happened. So, um, again, depending on the context, but I think you're gonna yeah, you this has a heavy real time component, um, and you, you because of that, you need to be able to do things at very quick. Speed. So we we got to so so this inf index and all of this gets us to the information retrieval where we have this uh, top k documents whatever. Now mm -hmm. we have an L LLM. Right now we assume in your application you have a single LLM that that handles uh, the response mm -hmm. to the end user. Um, but you, you in your conference at the Ray Summit, you also talked about another application which used multiple LLMs. Mm -hmm. So do you think it's going to be more common to have multiple LLMs for this? Yeah. So actually, uh, what you're talking about is using our application as one of the agents for another application. Yeah. Before that, actually, this was something we didn't anticipate building. But even within our RAG application, we realized there are different types of queries people are asking. Some were code related, some were highly right. complex, some were directly, you know, you can identify information in our docs. So we actually started uh, routing to multiple LLMs within our application first. So uh, we, we call this kind of hybrid routing, but we we trained a supervised model to be able to do this. So you'd pass in the query uh, and it would decide which of these LLMs is, is best appropriate. So far we've we've built it in a way that it would send it to one of them. But um, I think for different people's applications, you could have kind of, it's go going to multiple LLMs and kind of using the generations from multiple of those and putting them together. So Philip, he used the word supervised. To me, mm -hmm. that means labeled data. So how much labeled data do you need in, in this context? In our case, we hand labeled about 2000 queries. Um, that's, that's still a lot, man. Um, and, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but I guess it's doable in an afternoon by one person with, in a spreadsheet, right? So exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and then, well, um, and then you can also use um, um, uh, feedback from the users, like upward, downward, or these kind of things, to um, to to do a larger scale. Yeah, 
And you know, 2000 does sound like a lot, uh, but again, this is another reason why if you're building for your context, you can do it fairly quickly, that labeling. Um, something else that's definitely worth trying here is depending on the complexity of your classification here, uh, let's say for ours is three classes, right? Llama, Code Llama, GPT-4, for example. Um, you could do a small subset and then for the rest of the labeling, pass it on to uh, a generative model to actually make that task a little bit easier. Um, so kind of go back and forth here to do this, but that's one way. Another thing which we haven't explored yet, um, because our, our use case we feel is simple enough where we could use a supervised model, is instead of supervised, why not have that be an, an LLM as well, um, right? Instead of, and again, binning into one class or a subset of classes, have the LLM decide which of the LLMs downstream, larger LLMs it should route to. And maybe you can get away with using a smaller language model here that's perhaps fine-tuned to uh, get the form that you want. Um, and this is another reason why I think as a whole, in any scale, we're trying to just make serving open source LLMs extremely fast, extremely cheap, so that you can actually use not just one LLM in your application for the ultimate generation, but multiple LLMs in different nodes to actually create an application like this that, that could be a lot more complex and uh, bespoke to you, your use case. So let me ask you guys this. So so there's RAG, right? So we, we which we've talked about. So what is the boundary? So I, I imagine it's never going to be an either or. Is it RAG or a specialized custom LLM that you arrive at whatever in whatever way you want to fine tuning, whatever, right? So Imagine a scenario where someone types in a query and for some reason you realize, well, that query can be handled by my fine-tuned specialized model. I don't have to go through the rag thing. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that will be a common uh, scenario for people? So you, in other words, you have kind of, even at the query stage, you can route to the specialized model or through the rag. Yeah, I, I think so. A use case that comes to mind when you say this that a lot of people fine tune models for is for SQL generation. Um, so there, the base LLMs were not great at actually producing the right form, right? The right structure that the generated SQL uh, query should look like. Um, so their fine tuning first made a lot of sense. But I feel anytime you are trying to not change how the model's outputs look or the form of it, but instead you're trying to inject certain facts that before generation that this language model should be aware of, um, we feel RAG is absolutely the way to go. And as we've already talked about right now, right, even within the embedding layer, fine tuning that, perhaps fine tuning the ultimate gener, the LM that's going to do the final generation to look, uh, to have a form of a certain way. Using fine tuned elements in the RAG app is, is seems to be the promising direction. So it's kind of like a, a both world. Uh, a little Venn diagram in my head, but I can see some applications where if the sole job is to generate query that doesn't, SQL queries that don't, doesn't um, depend on external information, maybe you just have an endpoint there that points to a fine-tuned uh, model there, right? Maybe you don't need to have all this retrieval and knowledge injection happening. So let's say, so let's say you have uh, a scenario where you have a fine-tuned model that can handle a certain subset of queries, but then, you know, the rank can also handle that same subset of queries. What's going to be faster? Hmm. Where, uh, where where would you send it? Well, my this is my guy. I'd love to hear Phillips on this as well. But hopefully, you're fine tuning something, and you can get away with a smaller model, right? So that's one of the big perks of fine tuning. Uh, you can get superior performance on a smaller model. Um, but if it's going through rag, usually this is typical. The ultimate model that's doing the generation is going to be a large one, um, and you have all this added latency for actually doing the retrieval of knowledge. So unless your task requires that, perhaps maybe that RAG isn't the right thing to use there, right? Uh, but, yep. So, uh, by the way, uh, Philip, so in the RAG case, right? So you went through the, you went through the uh, vector database, you retrieved uh, relevant contacts. Uh, why do you need such a great model at that point when you already have some level of knowledge? So explain, uh, give give the listeners an intuition why you still need a great model at that point. So it depends on the on the use case, right? Like yeah. sometimes the information is exactly in the sources, 
then then a bit of summarization is good enough and then you don't need a great model but sometimes like um you need some additional reasoning nice. put some, co some code snippets or like depending on your application and then and then the powerful lm can really help so it depends a little bit um, on the use case yeah mm -hmm. i think one of the great things about the last six months specifically is that um one debate that's kind of disappearing is that these LLMs are not just memorization machines, right? Just because they have billions of parameters doesn't mean they're just memorizing everything. Their ability to reason is one of the most like most amazing attributes that we use them, right? Why we use them. So having a model like that that can reason on top of the knowledge that you're pointing to, um, it's able to extend uh, to the capability that, you know, asking one of our devs or, or us to answer a question, right? So that kind of um, not that direction of being able to reason and actually do some complex thinking on top of the information is, is the reason to use these larger models. Um, otherwise, I would agree, right? If you don't need that and you're just pulling data as is, maybe you just show the five links or, you know, the top retrieved sources and say that's enough. But um, yeah, it's about like making that experience better for the user, pointing them to uh, answer as a service as opposed to just a bunch of search results as the ultimate um, kind of thing that you show the user. So in uh, in the rag application, as uh, the way you folks laid out, um, is the main performance bottleneck. By that I mean, you know, the difference between uh, ten milliseconds and twenty milliseconds. Is that always going to be the LLM? Yeah, that... pretty much. And there actually, um, so as we all know, the user latency is really crucial, and like bringing that down is very important. Um, one technique that is the most useful there is to, as soon as the LLM produces the first token, you can like stream that to the user and, and show it to the user, so that as the output is produced, um, it will immediately show up for the user, and that makes the whole application much more usable. Um, so you have this very first part where you retrieve the documents, that's almost instant, mm -hmm. and then and then the LLM um, um, possibly the, the context that's typically pretty fast and then and then you start producing the output and immediately stream it to the user mm -hmm. but that's the difference between chat gpt and bard right <laughs> because bard you have to sit and wait for it to chat gpt starts typing right exactly exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. now these user experience things it's a big deal yeah and so then uh the the in terms of in terms of overall performance the the llm is always going to be somewhat of a bottleneck because you can maybe tweak a little bit around the vector database right so make that faster but yeah. uh, there's not much you can do if 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 it returns a con a bunch of uh, uh answers that the llm has to somehow make sense of mm -hmm. it's going to be slow yeah exactly right uh which is one of the reasons we're as a company we're working on making that a whole lot better because that's that's a universal bottleneck for everybody right now. And yeah, the more we can improve that, I think everybody's uh, SLAs will be met. <laughs> yep. So so the uh, go and the information retrieval, right? So so you get a bunch of relevant documents. Mm -hmm. Uh I guess the things that you can uh, tweak there are what? The uh, embedding model, the chunking, and the information retrieval. Because basically, the more relevant those documents are, the easier time the LLM will have, and therefore the faster, snappier the application is, right? Correct, yeah. Um, within the chunking first, we actually we try to build things generalizable so people could actually take this template that we've created and apply it on, on their data set. So our documentation, HTML pages, we wanted to create sections first. So we had a very simple function that would create sections for a given page. And then we would apply this chunking logic that we're all familiar with within each section, uh, just so there's no weird cutoffs there. Um, but yeah, the, the chunking length itself, the chunking overlap that you have there, uh, the embedding model itself. Um, and, you know, I guess fortunately or unfortunately, for example, chunking length and the number of chunks that you can decide you you can treat them as independent but they're not they're very much dependent and you have to multiply them together and then compare that to what is the context length that your model actually allows for and also for the embedding representation right what is the what is the what is for a specific embedding model that you're using what does it it expect so yeah there's all, all these uh highly correlated things you have to compare but um with this evaluation workflow that we had with the retrieval score and quality score and overall score we could choose different values for each of these different nodes and get a quality score at the end and then actually compare it across all the different other experiments that we want to run as well. 
And another thing that is really crucial, obviously, for the answers is the quality of your underlying data, right? right. And so this is also something where building the application actually, um, when, when you study what is what went wrong, oftentimes you find that actually that there's some problem with the underlying um, and documentation or the underlying sources, and then you can also improve that. So you, you get a flywheel um, running of uh, improvement, and then that makes also the application better. So, yeah. Yeah. Ben, it's kind of coming back to this, let's say we, this podcast was about, was about supervised deep learning. We're kind of hitting the same topics, right? Data quality. Yeah. This basically is the same. I would say allows us to identify weak spots in our data sources or our products that we can immediately act on. And maybe it's a faster route to identify those points as compared to like a supervised scenario here, right? So we've, we're actively working on setting up workflows where for whatever reason, user does a downvote or we have a a category or a cluster of things that we're not performing well on it can we can we point and figure out where is the root cause and if it is in our product or in documentation in this case we can quickly make the changes there little flywheel here where we can make the change there that would improve the application itself users are happier more adoption and we can keep continuing on this by the way uh, philip just pointed out something there that uh, hadn't occurred to me which is basically uh and uh, Gopal as well, data quality in the following sense. Uh, uh, I have friends who work in computer vision, mm -hmm. and uh, listeners can go to their website, visual-layer.com, visual mm -hmm. I think. And yeah. basically, they do data quality for visual data uh, with, the, with the mindset that, you know, the better quality your visual data is, the better your training is, mm -hmm. uh, the better everything is all around, the more efficient everything is so they can do deduplication blurred images they can get rid of they can find mislabeled Im uh, images and so on and so forth and it just occurred to me i mean uh, we need something like this for text as well because let's say i have a hundred thousand pdfs and there's a paragraph or ideas in there that appear 200 times i don't need all of that uh mm -hmm. during the information retrieval phase right so yeah. But no one seems to be working on these problems, right? It's often a little bit ad hoc way. I mean, uh, even as part of our application, we do this. Like sometimes there's duplicated things, and then we deduplicate and things like that. So yeah, I mean, yeah. Any every any time you can kind of improve the data, obviously improves the application. Mm -hmm. In this case, right? Absolutely. Yeah. That the that has not changed. Coming supervised or generative, so points it back to the data. All right, so let's close with something that's been bugging me, which is open source in the context of LLM. So open source software, I don't want to get into licenses because that's a religious discussion, right? So so what are some basic things that we assume when we talk about open source software? I can use it. I can modify it. I can read, read and learn from it. Right, so I think those are kind of the three basic things. So, with that in mind, I want to put you guys on the spot, on the record, right? So, when someone tells you my I, this is an open source LLM, what do you expect it to reveal? So, for sure, it need, we need to wait, right? That's like very basic. Um, um, you need to wait, and you also need the permission to use those weights in the appropriate context. Um, and um, oftentimes something that people have in mind here is if people say it's an open source model you need, probably some amount of be able to use it in a commercial context um, even. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. So what about, so uh, so I compiled a list. I don't know if my list is too much. Maybe I'm too demanding. Um, so you said weights and parameters, right? So Philip, do you wanna get a sense of the architecture? So yes, um, I also need to be able to run the thing, right? Um, otherwise, there's no point. And then I need to have the model architecture. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, as I'm, I'm a heavy proponent of open source software, as you know. And like, like, ideally, I would even like to be able to like get some insight into the training or even train it myself. That's unfortunately at the moment often not the case. But I hope we will have more and more of that going forward. <clears throat> yeah. So, and so then... what about uh, like? Uh... Um, let's see. So like the loss function, the optimization method they use, do they have to reveal that? Or, or do I, they have to, I mean, it's the, so mm -hmm. I'm, 
right now I'm just mostly asking you guys what is your must have yeah for you to classify something as open source in the sense that uh, I guess not must have it's a minimum almost like the minimal so that this is open source I can fine tune it I mm-hmm. can do more things with it. So what what are those minimal minimal things? So weights, I, I think we established, right? Agreed. Yeah. Weights and architecture, I, I would agree as well. So you can continue to grow on it. Um, this is this is such an involved question. I think we'll have, as we see already, we'll have different flavors of open source. Um yeah, I, like this is a my personal view, but especially for these large language models, for them to be open, you have typically not individuals or even a small group of unrelated individuals. It's usually large organizations that have are pouring in a lot of financial resources to enable this. Um, so I think that's why as a community, we're kind of almost accepting that, okay, you, you're allowing us, giving us the, the weights and architecture and that's good enough. But I think going forward, because of the how, how like how per- pervasive the use of LLMs are and the applications and industries that's being used in, we may start to see more regulation um, I would argue for the better in terms of at least what kind of data it was used to train and attune these models, um, just so we can know what is the spread of data. Like for me, when I, going back to supervised deep learning world, like, like is I said, uh, more mainly English, or in, exactly. in the case of programming, is it mostly Python? Exactly right. Uh, some kind of innocuous use cases are I do- to- documentation of the data. Yes, documentation of data, right? Some simple use cases are, I need to know what my this model that I'm about to use hasn't seen that is important to me. So I may actually spend some time at first, at least tuning it on that. Um, but I may also need to know if there are some nefarious subsets of the data that I wouldn't want these models to be aware of uh, and see that maybe I wouldn't use this model. So yeah, I think as we kind of go deeper and deeper and LM applications start to impact more and more of our lives, uh, There'll be more. I, I would like to see more than just the the weights and architecture. Um, so I think uh, so. Another so there's uh you know to have an open source model as part of a rag application. That's one thing, right? So almost like that. I may not even need the weights. I just need. I guess I need the weights to use it, right? So, but uh, once I want to try to modify it, Philip. What about things like uh, like like what you guys raised very early on how did what's the evaluation method how how is the data pre-processed because what if i want to add more data how mm. so does that have to be revealed right it, for the base llm i mean it's not it's not part of the absolute requirements i think but i hope that going forward we will have more and more of that um i mean it's a little bit similar to um open source before llms right like there are some projects that have like the appropriate license and you can use it and everything like that and then there are projects that go farther they are actually an open community and like everybody can can contribute and they have sort of guidelines on what kind of contributions they accept and things like that mm-hmm. and like and i think with llms it's the same thing i mean going forward there will be more things where more and more things are open and like that's really great for the community and then there will be more iteration on these um and so everybody will benefit so know? so goku you just did a deep dive on evaluation in the context of rags don't you care about evaluation methods they used for their llms no, or i mean i guess my question is does that matter in order does, for you to use it well i think so right especially if we are going down this direction of fine-tuning these llms for no, maybe not just the ultimate generative llm but for different nodes we need to know that uh kind of getting to the needier part of my list and maybe it's on yours too ben I, we'd I, ideally love to know like what was their setup even right like what are the parameters that you've used how did the, how did you change for example the, the, your scheduler for the learning rate if i were to continue and fine tune from where it was left off i a lot of times you want to use the same configuration right um these still follow this a lot of the same loss techniques that we're familiar with 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 supervised and, and self-supervised so i'd like to even know those details so i can continue properly and use the resources that I have the best I can. So um, yeah, the, our list is growing quickly, but uh, I, I think you're right, like to to actually tailor these models for our use case. And if that's the objective, we, we need to, there should be more that is available as part of the open. Is, is there more, Philip, that you wanna know to make, uh, if your focus is just to use it for inference, are there things you want, you would like to know about the model that will help you? deliver inference faster or 
more efficiently or whatever? Well, you also need sort of an underlying software stack, right? Of like um, doing the inference. So like if that's open source, that's definitely a plus. Um, 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 and then possibly for the evaluation, like if you run it yourself, the model, then you would want to know like, how do I make sure that actually I'm doing the right thing and like um, have some yeah, the evaluation um, and to be able to to check um, that you deployed in the correct way. <clears throat> so go earlier, you brought up these technical terms, right? So learning rate, regular, regularization and, and things like that. Are those things you need to know in order for you to bless it as open source? Uh, ideally, that would be nice, right? For example, um, so we have we have you can tune fine tune models as well through our AnyScale endpoints. But um, let's say we wanted to do it from a more granular level using Ray Train, uh, having that information would be very useful, right? Because we can directly use where it was left off and continue setting our schedulers from that point of origin. Otherwise, we have a really good chance of offshooting, for example, right, uh, any kind of learning that we want to do. And we'll have to, again, get back to the world of tweaking things manually and, and figuring out, trying to get to maybe the, the configuration that was used uh, in the last epoch for, for training these base LLMs. So, so with that said, do any of the open source LLMs have everything we just uh, listed? Probably not, huh? None has everything, I would yeah. say. Um, but yeah, um, hopefully in the future we will get more things. Yeah. All right. Actually, I I, I do have one more question. Going back to Rag, so uh, some naive listeners will go, well, can't we just reuse Raytune to tune the Rag? Yeah. <laughs> so so yep. tell us why this is not a good idea. Well, I wouldn't say it's not a good idea. Mm -hmm. Um. It, um. Um. Like you can definitely use right tune to tune the hyperparameters, um, and like. Oh, you uh, mean uh, it'll have like a list of possible embeddings, list of possible yeah. chunking strategies, mm -hmm. like yeah. a combinatorial just search, grid search. Exactly, because of, for example, how compute intensive these evaluation runs are. For our first run, uh, Ben, we've been kind of testing out one node at a time, for example, the chunking logic embedding model, and then we'll fix it and before we move on. But uh, I actually brought this up to Philip at the beginning. Uh, was, there is actually no reason you you can't look at it from a, a fully combinatorial view. You have this large search space that may you may actually end up finding an even better configuration. But uh, again, going back to like, what is our time better spent on? We right. feel like if you can fix a decent set of choices along the way and then get back to kind it, of make it's not it's not your time, Goku. It's the computer's time. <laughs> you know what I mean? So if you have well, enough if if you have enough compute. So the question there is uh, after all it's said and done, you did do do this grid search. Did you overfit? <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. Actually, Ben, um one thing that is true of supervised deep learning world, for example, you you'll have a configuration. And then the next cycle, you retrain your model, whether it's continuous or manual, your data set is new, right? There's some changes, there's a delta. A lot of times, especially when there's some kind of concept shift or something, or even data drift, the configurations you used before are no longer the best. And you're going to have to, you, you run this the tuning trials again. Um, I, I could see that being a high parallel here, especially as we're starting to think about iteration workflows. It may make sense to actually automatically run this tuned experiment where you're not there to handhold it at every node and say this is the value we're going to fix. This is the value we're going to fix. Maybe have it actually truly run like a hyperparameter search. It's more like a hyper component search as well, um, and have that be automated. And yeah, using Ray Tune uh, to do that uh, could be a very powerful and scalable way to do it. And you're right. You you don't. It's not your time, right? With the right compute resources, you can have this run anytime there's a delta in your system. And you get the report saying, hey, new model deployed with this configuration. Here's here's the evaluation uh, metrics for it. And with that said, I'll link to the blog post. And uh, also, uh, uh, for our listeners who are not yet aware of uh, any scale endpoints, check it out. I've moved most of what I do over there from OpenAI, uh, which I still use. But, you know, you, most of the volume you can actually... Uh, do on the AnyScale endpoints, they're faster, more stable, and obviously uh, much cheaper. And I guess AnyScale now also has endpoints for fine tuning and private endpoints so that you have uh, uh, complete control over your intellectual property and data.
And with that, thank you, uh, Philip and Gopal. Thank you so much for having us.